Welcome to Inside Bremerton. This is the City of Bremerton's video newsletter. What a beautiful day today. We are on the beach under the Warren Avenue Bridge and we're going to talk about a shoreline master plan, master program update. Joining me is Nicole Ward. Nicole is a city planner with our Department of Community Development. Welcome, Nicole. Hi, Char. So here we are on the beach under the Warren Avenue Bridge. We're at the end of Elizabeth Street. I consider it a really nice beach, but the city needs to update their master plan for shorelines. Why do we do that? Well, back in the 1970s, the legislature created the Shoreline Master Program, which each specific jurisdiction has to create regulations for their specific beaches. So there's 263 jurisdictions in the state that have what's called shorelines of statewide significance. Each one of them has to create regulations for their beaches to ensure that there's public access and also protect natural habitats. So we're updating it because we created it in 1970s and then again we, we updated it in 1992, but that's almost 20 years, mm -hmm. so it, it's about time. Mm -hmm. um, do we do all shoreline? Is it saltwater shoreline or is it freshwater as well? It's both. It's anything that's of statewide significance. So the only freshwater shorelines that we have are things like Kitsap Lake. Mm -hmm. We don't have any rivers, so it's mostly the saltwater shoreline, Kitsap Lake, reservoirs where we get our water, and those types of areas. Mm -hmm. So we must have some significant shoreline, because knowing we live in Bremerton, we have a lot of shoreline here. Yeah, we have some, we're probably one of the largest jurisdictions with shoreline. We probably have about 20 miles or so of shoreline. So how is this plan, how is this going to impact our average Bremerton citizen? Well, the regulations do two things. Like I mentioned earlier, it's got a real emphasis on public ac access and vis it's visual and physical. So there's parks and w areas where you can walk down and physically touch the beach, but also visually when you're driving downtown or anywhere, it's nice to know hey, there is a shoreline over there. So there's requirements in the code that say that you have to provide view corridors so that people can still see that they're on the water or public access areas so that people can walk and maybe have a viewing platform to look out over the water or have actual physical access to the water. Residential projects also are impacted. Anybody within 200 feet of the shoreline has to have really specific requirements, a specific distance from the shoreline, a view corridor as well, height limits that are different than other places in the city. Mm -hmm. And what we have right now are, are just blanket requirements. So for residential properties, there's a general distance you have to be from the shoreline or a general view corridor. So it sounds like a lot of these regulations are already in place. Are we going to be making changes? Are we going to do some big changes, do you think? Yeah, this is a pretty big overhaul for the Shoreline Master Program. And as I said before, it's almost been 20 years since we've mm -hmm. updated it. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of science that has changed. Right. And we know a lot more about where habitat lives, what types of habitat needs specific areas. And what we're hopefully going to do is create regulations. Instead of it being a blanket, everybody has this regulation, mm -hmm. we're going to have regulations that really are specific to this area has habitat, so it requires this specific setback. This area does not have habitat, so maybe it has less of an impact. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really great that we have the science. And one of the really interesting things about the science is that it's showing that the edges where the water meets the land are some of the more important areas. Right. It's just not something people think about very often. Exactly. This transition area. Mm -hmm. So we are at a transition area right here on this beach. And there's, there's different kinds of transition. There's man-made ones, which you'd have kind of behind us here, where it's, it's like a bulkhead or riprap. And there's natural ones where it's just gen the gentle shore or there's maybe a, a bluff or that type of thing. So I'd like to just tell you mm -hmm. a little bit about the natural please, shoreline. Please do. Over to the left here we have this natural shoreline and you can see how it goes gently sloping up with rocks and then it turns to sand and then there's trees and things that are shading that. And really natural looking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very natural. Not a lot of stuff that looks like it was brought in. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's really good for habitat because it provides places for the young fish and small little critters to hide. 
So if you notice, we've got some really nice sand, sand up here. That fish lay eggs all over in the rocks, but a real specific type of fish lays eggs only in the sandy areas, which is called the sand lance. And that's where salmon get most of their food, especially juvenile salmon. They eat mostly sand lance. So the areas where the sand lance lay their eggs are really important for salmon. And if you notice, the sand over here has, it, it's shaded from the trees so that in the hot summer days when the sun is beating down on it, it's got shade and the eggs won't dry out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and then we've got this unnatural shoreline right next to us. So how does this affect the habitat? And the difference is that if you look, you don't see any, sh any of the nice sandy areas mm -hmm. over here. Mm -hmm. What you end up with is a much sharper slope where the waves come and they, re they just crash into the beach. Right. So in this case, it's not a very good place for habitat because especially the young fish, they come and they're, they're young, they don't really know how to swim very well or whatnot, and then they're, they're really challenged because mm -hmm. there's riprap that's, that's not giving them a lot of hiding places, and also the wave action is hard. And the other thing about this is that it really doesn't provide a natural walking path for people. So it goes back to public access. It's not a very easy area to access. Mm -hmm. um, we see a lot of the trees and shrubs and um, natural growth and vegetation along here. Um, is the city going to remove the stuff that looks like it was dumped here? Will we have the ability to do that, or will that be required in our plan? It's possible. It's one of the things we're looking at. In terms of, of this plan, what we'd like to do is have no net loss. And what that means is that we take a base, elevate, or a base line of what is out here right now and how habitat is affected now. And then when we have development in the future, we try not to impact it more negatively than, than now. Awesome. So that what that means is you could maybe impact an area and then clean up another area so mm -hmm. that it balances out in the end. Mm -hmm. I would think a majority of our citizens would be really interested in this. This is really affects our whole community. We have so much waterfront here. Um, Nicole, I want to look across the water to it looks like a new development. We see condos there and we see this um, is it gravelly slope and a bulkhead? Is that something new? It is. The, the development over there is not new. It was developed probably in the 1980s, and they had the standard setback away from the bluff, and I'm sure that they were set back plenty far when they mm -hmm. built the buildings. However, over time, there's been erosion. So with storms and, and that type of thing, you end up with the slope falling off into the water, which is really great for habitat. It provides nutrients and sediments and all of these areas for the, the small fish to, to forage and live, not so good for people. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. a really great example of where we really need to balance the needs of the, of the people and the habitat. And so over here, what you end up with is some of these houses, condos, are about six feet from the cliff. But they didn't start out that way. They didn't start out that it way. It was probably from one of our big, big storms and it's many storms. Many storms. Yeah. And it sloughed off, and now it ended up being very close to this individual's condo. That's or right. Or many condos. That's right. So what they did is they, they built a bulkhead to protect the, the human population up there and, and protect property. So it's a really good example of when, when health, life, and safety issues of people are, are a concern, really that's going to be a more primary concern than mm -hmm. the habitat needs and they did build that bulkhead substantially back from the ordinary high water mark so that there still will be public access and hopefully there will be areas for the fish to live. Wow. Well, and I'm sure that's happened in other parts of our community where storm uh, runoff, damage, slough off of, a, of the um, natural slope has been happening. This one almost looks a little bit scary and I bet it cost them a few bucks to fix that. It did. It cost about $400,000. However, they did get federal grant money to help oh, work on that. Great. Well, so we're asking, Nicole's asking for citizen help to get going on this plan. The deadline is to get to the state mid-2012. Right. So roughly three years from now, but a lot of work 
needs to start happening probably in 2010, 2011. Nicole's going to hold public meetings. Tell us how people can get involved. Well, we're going to have a lot of public meetings, and the idea is to get input on what's happening on your shoreline, what's going on in terms of what do you need, what do you want, how do it's your shoreline, mm -hmm. let's make it a good place for everybody. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have a lot of public meetings, and if you're interested in getting involved, please let me know. You can email me, you can call me, you can come to the Norm Dix Government Center, mm -hmm. any of those ways. We really want to help create a clear, concise, and fair code so that it's good for all the citizens. Very exciting work, Nicole. Really exciting work. And please get involved in this process. Um, not only if you're a waterfront owner, but you live here in the city and these are public beaches. And we want to maintain them. We want to have them for thousands of years to come. And really think about the public access piece, views of the water, everything Nicole just reviewed. You can reach Nicole at the city of Bremerton. Her direct line is 360-473-5279. Her email is Nicole, right on the screen, nicole.ward at ci.bremerton.wa.us. We're urging folks to get involved. Talk to Nicole, she'll put your name on the list as far as when things start happening. And BCAT will do lots of updates for you and help you get the word out on when these meetings start happening. Nicole, you're a really good employee for the city of Bremerton. We're really proud of you. And now our science stuff gets to start working. This is really exciting for her. Thanks for joining us today on Inside Bremerton. Remember to uh, keep updated on the Shoreline Master Program Update with Nicole Ward. Thanks for joining us today. We'll see you next time.